Okay, welcome back. Sorry to rush you through lunch. Uh, so, what we've decided to do is really just merge up the last two sections because uh, we're running short on time. Uh, so, the paper presentations or the PowerPoint presentations and the round table discussion that we didn't charge, we're going to bring them together, club them together. Uh, and we've requested uh, uh, Madhukar, uh, Dr. Madhukar Sinha, to uh, moderate the session. So may I please invite uh, all the panelists in the session to please come up on stage, uh, Mr. Anand, uh, Shital, Anand, Ashil. Again, I think uh, the ones who need to leave this auditorium earliest ha fortunately happen to be the ones that are sitting on that panel, including Madhukar. So it's in their best interest to regulate themselves and make sure we finish this off in time. So with that, I'll, I'll just leave to Madhukar and uh, ask him to request him to take over from you. So good afternoon and welcome back from a rather sumptuous lunch. Um, we have um, four panelists here to keep you awake. I would try to lull you to sleep uh, normally with my rather soporic voice. So what I'll do is uh, I'll dispense with all the introductions because uh, except that um, we have Sheetal Chopra from FIKI. She uh, is here to articulate the industry uh, interests, what are the interests of the industry. Ms. Praveen Anand does not require any introduction in the IP fraternity. Okay? Oh, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and uh, then we have Anand Padnaman, uh, the author of the much bought book that is there. Uh, and uh, Ashil Fowler, another person with uh, a very, very interesting life and very interesting views. Okay? Now, the introductions are all there with you. So, we, what we will do is, uh, in terms of Mr. Anand being able to catch his flight. We'll, we'll start uh, with Mr. Anand's uh, talk. Uh, the topic is copyright enforcement, education and governance issues. And whenever we start talking about enforcement, two or three pictures uh, come to mind for laypersons like me. One is the man in khaki with a, with a lucky in hand, okay, uh, called Thulla in Delhi and uh, Mamu in this part of the country, okay, and uh, then uh, the other picture that comes is uh, people clad in black and uh, with white uh, bows. Uh, let me assure you that enforcement is much beyond that. It is also a, a, a very, very serious issue because it, it settles the way the law works. So uh, without more ado, uh, let me ask Mr. Anand to talk about how effective the uh, amendments are likely to be given your vast experience on enforcement issues. You're, you're completely up to you, wherever you are comfortable from. Are you comfortable with me speaking from here? Yeah? All right. I mean, talking of going to sleep, even I've got to remain up. So, standing is probably the better thing to do. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Mankar, and uh, the distinguished panel with my dear friends from the last some 25 years, some even longer. Um, let me say what a great pleasure it is to be here. I have um, never been to your college before. I've been here on a social visit, but never to speak, and I'm delighted by the arm twisting that Shamnath did. Um, he cautioned me that if I didn't accept this time, he would never invite me again. So uh, here I am. Um, I know that there's a time constraint, so I'll be very short, um, 10 minutes or so. I just want to apologize that I'm right in the midst of the Novartis case in the Supreme Court, which has been going on for more than 65 days now, with starting at 10.30 in the morning and going right up to 4 o'clock in the evening. And um, yesterday came the Pfizer case also, along with that, in the Supreme Court, and it was decided. 
So there's so much of pressure that I've just had to scribble some thoughts together. But I, let me try and speak to you straight from the heart so that you get a feel of what I feel in court from morning to night, each working day of course. First, what good is it that each one of you who is a potential artist, a potential author, a potential creator has no future in case you have in, in the event that the law doesn't enforce. We all know that. It's axiomatic. It's been said a million times. How good or bad are we in enforcement? And let me contrast on the one hand about 520 courts and on the other hand one court. The Delhi High Court versus all the other roughly 500 district courts, 23 high courts, that's 23 minus 1, 22 high courts and one Supreme Court. Let's contrast them. How long do you think a lawsuit would take if instituted in Mumbai before the Bombay, before, now it's called the Bombay High Court. It's, as you know, the High Court name never changed. It's Mumbai, but the Bombay High Court. So if a suit is instituted before the Bombay High Court, some of us have come to realize from experience that even a notice of motion or an injunction application will take not less than two years to be decided. And a lawsuit might go up to anything up to five to ten years, which is a very conservative estimate. And that can be the pretty much the standard for the entire country. Is that good? Everybody knows that that is where it really hurts. And what did the Delhi High Court do? The Delhi High Court did roughly eight things. And I don't have the time right now to tell you what those eight things were. But two of the most important was it subcontracted the collection of evidence from a, from a cluttered court and a busy judge to a retired judge who has all the time in the world. And it permitted that person to sit down in an executive center like the Oberoi Hotel's business center on a flat table with all witnesses, lawyers all around the table in an informal environment and collect evidence. So the man would give an appointment at 10 o'clock in the morning and by the end of the day, he would complete his evidence. So witnesses who have come from overseas, they filed evidence by way of affidavits, evidence recorded on a Friday. Cross-examination over. Witness can go back. If there are three witnesses in the case, you can have two, one after another. In three weeks' time, the entire plaintiff's evidence is over. In another three weeks, the defendant's evidence is over. Within two, three months, you're back to the judge for final arguments in the matter. These came to be called the four-month orders. Why? Because there are so many now that there's a regular scheduling done to make sure you get a four-month order. Nobody is interested in an interim injunction any longer. You would want evidence to be recorded. Complex technology matter, anything involving patents, anything involving, let's say, high technology in the copyright area, you would want evidence to be recorded. You would want expert testimony and the benefit of cross-examination. And at the end of the trial, you'll be entitled to, that's the second part. So the first is a time revolution. Without going into greater detail, this unfortunately has not caught on in any of the other courts in the country. I ask myself why. And to this date, I've not got an answer. I've read and I've read about other courts, but I have not got an answer as to why it doesn't happen in the rest of the country. And yet, Delhi High Court is the most criticized High Court for being so fast. The second revolution is a remedies revolution. The grant of an ex parte injunction, the grant of an anti pillar order for those of you who don't know 
the search and seizure order like a police raid in a civil matter is called an Anton Pillar order. And the grant of a Mariva injunction where the bank account can be seized or a Norwich Pharmacal order where you can discover the entire transaction through customs, excise documents, etc. and know where the money is being kept and where the power center is and how to get at the real guy. All those orders are unique remedies. But the biggest one was the grant of punitive and exemplary damages. When in 2005, somebody copied Time magazine in Hindi, called it Terme Aki Matra Time, on a magazine cover which had a red border. He was not only stopped, but the court granted an damages, saying that we would not only grant compensatory damages, but also punitive and exemplary damages. We will punish him. So although the plaintiff may have suffered one rupee, we will grant one rupee, plus we will grant one more rupee to punish him. Punitive damages. And those punitive damages were most important because the court said that there is so much of pressure on our criminal justice delivery system, we want to ease that pressure. And we want that pressure to move to the civil courts. But it will not move till the civil remedy is an attractive remedy. So the only way to do it is to raise the standard of civil litigation and grant damages. And we thought we've got the Time magazine order after from 1940s, the first reported judgment on damages in, IP, in an IP matter. It will not happen before the next three years, four years, five years. But from 2005 to now, six years have gone by, six, seven years. In seven years, there are 150 judgments of the Delhi High Court where punitive and exemplary damages have been granted, sizable ones, big damages. So the second revolution is you can get damages. You can go fast and you can get damages. Now combine the two. So somebody whose work is copied knows that even if it costs, costs his lawyer, with his lawyer it costs him something slightly more than what he can afford, but he'll be able to recover it by way of damages. And he can go really fast, so he's not talking about a horizon of three years or five years. He's talking about within one year he'll get a decree in his favor, possibly much earlier. If we have the time, we can talk about what happened in the Supreme Court yesterday in the Sutant matter. But it shows you the power that the Supreme Court wields. The patent was cancelled two months ago. 24th of September. The order was served on the client 28th of September. Yesterday was 27th. 27th of November. Within two months, it's been set aside by the Supreme Court. And there are proceedings before the Delhi High Court single judge, Delhi High Court division bench, and yet all of them, the order's been set aside, gone back for on remand for rehearing. Good or bad, I'm not on. I'm not on value judgment. But look at the power that the courts have on speed. The question is, we need to massage it. It's not happening in the rest of the country. All right, so I leave you with the time, the time re revolution and the remedies revolution as two major changes that have come about in enforcement. This is all very good. But the question is, we have an opportunity to introduce statutory damages in the Act. The whole world is moving towards statutory damages, so you don't have to prove damages. It's one of the most colossal things to have a statistical model where you can prove damages. We had an opportunity, we missed it. And the reason why I mention this is because the earlier title of your seminar was Missed Opportunities, which was later amended. But I would just therefore say that in case there is a future plan for amendment, statutory remedies, and I would urge some of you young students to do a paper on statutory remedies and try and see if you can start some kind of a, a, a study whereby the ministry could take advantage of that and perhaps form a core group and start discussions on having statutory damages.
so that a magistrate who does not have the wherewithal or the time to examine experts on damages can be guided because the guideline has been built into the statute. Right? So, let me come now to having dealt with the procedural aspects a few minutes on the changes that came about. The first and most important change that came about was on circumvention of technological measures and RMI. Right management information. Who is the author of the work? Who is the owner of the work? The name, address, what is the title of the work? This information cannot be tampered with. The moment somebody tampers, it's a criminal offense under our new law, which is a remarkably good provision. Because in most of these cases, you find people go to the roots and change. And the first case on circumvention of technological measures came up before the Delhi High Court recently, Sony PlayStation case, where we argued the case a few days before the amendments came into effect. So we told the judge that these amendments are in the pipeline. They, are, they had been passed but not yet given effect to. So the judge noticed them and passed an order which in substance recognized that coming out, using a program like Jailbreak from the internet to crack the Sony system and allow people to use um, pirated games on the system, that amounted to circumvention of technological measures. So do read that order, the Sony PlayStation case, it's an inspirational order of the Delhi High Court. The second, the section 65A and section 65B of the Act. The second is the internet changes where earlier the law used to be super cassettes versus MySpace, liability was strict, but now under section 521B and 521C, the new intermediaries are protected, provided, uh, they are protected against transient and incidental storage. That's something on which I'm not sure whether there has been a case so far, but I'm sure there will be very soon. The third is the section 53 on importation, where a provision on imported goods has been, uh, an amendment has been introduced. Customs officers have certain powers, but it is surprising that when we had the, uh, the intellectual property enforcement rules, imported goods enforcement rules 2007, this could have been exactly in pari materia with that provision. Unfortunately, it isn't. Under that provision, the customs have the adjudicatory powers to decide on their own. But here, you have to wait for 14 days. They'll wait for 14 days for you to get an order from the court. If you don't get an order from the court, the court will be, uh, they will enter commercial stream. So this is a contradiction. The benefit of the 2007 rules was before the government. They should have made a provision which was in pari materia. This is um, something that you might like to think about for future amendments. Then there is section 31D where there is a lot of thinking to be done. Um, statutory licenses in respect of television or radio broadcasting, is this a violation of burn? Um, does it defeat the whole objective of a voluntary license? And the conditions of section 31 for a, a compulsory license are absent. The conditions of being withheld from the public or uh, terms being unreasonable. So this is something which requires somebody's detailed study Perhaps somebody might even challenge this in a repetition. We don't know. And finally, I'd like to touch on the 15.2 provision where we have gone on and off twice. What have we done? Earlier, this is the three-dimensional reproduction of engineering drawings. And so this is also a 3D provision, not the 3D of patent law, 
both the 3Ds are giving us a problem. Here, it is three-dimensional reproduction of an engineering drawing amounting to a violation of copyright in such a drawing. So let's say you have a strip of Popeye the Sailor, a comic strip, and somebody makes a doll of Popeye. Then is that a violation of the copyright in the comic? And cases have said it is. Because you can reproduce comic to comic, that is two dimension to two dimension, like in a photocopy, or you can do it three dimensionally, where you are taking the real essence of the character and making a doll out of it. So that's how reproduction extended. Now, if reproduction extended like that, earlier there was, some, there was a 52-1W as a defense, which had been removed from the act. It had been removed, and as a result, of that, a lot of the cases were decided in favor of plaintiffs who alleged three, that there was a violation by three-dimensional reproduction. Now, this amendment puts back 52-1W, but with a change. So it's all a matter of how you interpret, time is short, but essentially it would appear to me that an interpretation can be given that Copyright in drawings, in artistic works, will continue to subsist in accordance with the Mattel decision, the Scrabulous decision of the Delhi High Court, and the uh, decision in uh, uh, microfibers. But what is likely to happen is that if, uh, let's say, there is a drawing of a bottle, if that bottle has been made into a bottle, uh, from a drawing made into a three-dimensional bottle, it is the copyright in the design which will get destroyed on being reproduced more than 50 times, but not the copyright in the artistic work, which means you could have an ashtray shaped like a bottle, or you could have a T-shirt with that picture of the bottle, all enjoying copyright, or you could have, uh, let's say, a mic shaped like a bottle, there the copyright would not get destroyed. It's the copyright in that design which was reproduced 50 times. That's one aspect. And the second aspect, if you look at the newly inserted 52.1W, it appears to say the language used is um, purely functional parts. What gets destroyed is only the copyright in the, what is not an infringement, is the copyright in the purely functional parts. Something which is not purely functional, but partly aesthetic, aesthetic and partly functional, or mainly aesthetic and only um, uh, functional to a very small degree, it could escape 521W, which means you may not be able to stop plain stuff like a nut or a bolt, but if it is a functional thing, it is, if it's aesthetic, uh, something beautiful, and also has a function, you may still be able to stop it if you read the two sections together. That appears to be the uh, sum total of the new law. I know I've taken much more than I said I would. I'm sorry about that. Um, if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Yeah, so, Mr. Anand, uh, let me just quickly uh, summarize if I can, because you yes. have already uh, put it in a summary form, but uh, talked about the two revolutions that have taken place in uh, the adjudication part of uh, by the Delhi High Court that is on the time revolution you said and the remedies revolution uh, you talked of uh, uh, the specific opportunity you thought we lost in the amendments that is of statutory damages um, uh, you were appreciative of the circumvention provisions uh, that have now been put in uh, with the Sony station case as uh, your tests over here and then you have uh, talked about uh, specific problems that you perceive on Section 53, Section 31D, and Section 15.2, read with uh, 52.1W. So um, a very interesting, uh, and a person who is a practitioner, who is not a, a person who is uh, working out of uh, an office, uh, but is actually um, <coughs> there before the bench. So uh, we'll take, uh, since, again, let me say that we have have the benefit of having the topmost practitioner in the country over here. We'll take more than two questions. So the first question, yeah. Can I come there and answer? Yeah. 
So you mentioned uh, the Sony case as a circumvention of uh, DRMs. As a circumvention of the DRMs, the Sony case, uh, don't you think it prevents access considering the circuit court's decisions in Apple versus Holden and Smith versus Apple where actually jailbreaking was declared to be legal under the free ride provisions of the DCMA? Again, a question of attitude. Hello. Yeah, that's fine. I think it's, you can multiply cases. After all, what is a case? A case is the opinion of a single judge or perhaps more than a single judge, depending on how big the bench is. But if there is 100 years of law and one judge comes and says, I don't agree, you call it the latest case and then you flag it around saying this is the case, the latest one, which has changed the law. It hasn't. It's just one man's opinion on a particular morning. Right? Therefore, at the end of the day, what you will learn, and I'm sure each one of us learn, including myself every day, is from our creative industry, we learn that we have to take an approach on these things. Sometimes having the right knowledge on intellectual property is not good enough. What's very important is to love the subject is to love intellectual property and to respect creativity wherever it may come from, whichever source it may come from. If Sony has put in its money, I do believe that they deserve that protection. And free speech, what does, it, what does I, I don't understand the limits of free speech quite fully. And I, I really don't agree that any one judge could just throw out this important concept which our legislators have thought it wise to put in into our legislation. Sir, but won't it have uh, both uh, comp uh, competition law repercussions as well as uh, access issues? Well, the question is, why should somebody have access without payments, without buying the original? If, if I want to ensure that I have two, a sandwich structure, the sandwich being First, I have a lower bread, which is a statement of the copyright law which says, do not copy. Then I have a second layer, which is a lock, which is a technology layer. I put a lock or whatever else. I put a dongle, I put a lock, I put a password. And then I have a third layer, which is again a law, which says if you break the second layer, namely the technology, you are a violator just as much as you were a violator if you broke the first layer, the copyright layer. So you form a technology sandwich. Now the point is, if you want to have access, there is a certain structure available. Otherwise, if access is the issue, I mean, we can keep debating till the cows come home, what all you can demand access to. Can you pass on the mic there, please? Please do introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Suraj K. Abraham. I'm from Nuaz, Kerala. And I totally agree with you, Pravin, sir, with respect to access and technological protection message. But my question is, at the end of the day, if I take a laptop and check out on any torrent site or a file sharing site, I will be able to get uh, all the uh, games or all the movies which has been technologically protected or which has been properly uh, locked with the, uh, let's say, latest technology. So uh, in order to prevent this, the uh, ultimate aim should be to uh, make sure that the uploader and the downloader, that is the uh, one who is breaking it and one who is actually using it, uh, is liable before the law. Uh, he should be, I mean, he should be made accountable and he should be made the, uh, he should be effectively imposed. The damage should be imposed on him rather than making an intermediary liable for, you know, uh, facilitating uh, your life who is uh, running a business, uh, merely a conduit. So how far the law has been successful enough to make this uh, thing into practice? Okay, can I take a minute to explain yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. This is a very, very interesting point. If you see the software uh, anti-piracy campaigns, 
they were started with uh, business software alliance members like Microsoft, Adobe, Autodesk, uh, Tata Consultancy Services, etc. They grouped, they joined hands, they joined NASCOM, and they started having these actions. And then they realized that they were taking actions against retailers, but the people who were actually using the software were getting away scot-free. So they changed the focus of their campaign and started going after users. So the user may be a factory manufacturing shoes, totally legitimate in everything except that he bought five software packages and used it on 10 or 100. So he was illegitimate in software use, that means he was violating copyright, but legitimate in all other respects. So they started what they called the end user campaign. The result of that was that whenever a person would be, whenever an action would be taken, the proprietor of the organization, partner, director would come forward and say, we want to settle, we don't want publicity, we don't want to be in the, on the front pages of newspapers. So settlements would come through quickly, licenses would be signed up, and that's how the campaign was very, very successful. And I do believe, therefore, that in our copyright law, for computer software, even use of computer software is an offense. But use is not an offense when it comes to reading a book. If I'm reading a pirated book, it's not an offense. If I'm watching a pirated film, it's not an offense. But if I'm using a pirated program, it's an offense. And the logic of that was that whenever you use a program, you necessarily reproduce it in the RAM of the computer. A reproduction takes place. Now, I'm not sure what the position would be for the circumvention provisions. It will have to be seen on a case-to-case -case basis. Some technologies like, let's say, DVD, does not involve any algorithm in the, uh, in the DVD itself. It's just, as you know, lands and pits cut out on a, on a disc and a laser that reads them. But an algorithm involved in compression, which breaks a string of bits into 16 units, what is known as uh, CFM plus, the CFM plus technology of DVD. So if you can show that that part, which is a software, has been copied, then you certainly have provisions in the law to catch the end user. If, on the other hand, the person has only copied a hardware component, then there's no software involved, then, of course, the end user can't be. You can't catch the end user. Yeah. Pranesh. Hello. Uh, my name is Pranesh Prakash. I'm policy director at the Center for Internet and Society. It's a pleasure to hear you again, uh, Mr. Anand. Uh, I met you a couple of years ago uh, at a conference organized by WIPO in Delhi. And uh, one of the points I'm about to make, I made there as well, is on the Anton Blur order, right? So uh, as I noted then, the person who originated these orders, uh, Sir Hugh Laddie, uh, he, in later years, went on to regret it. He called it a Frankenstein's monster that went far beyond my original brief. Okay, and this was in the UK where it is still a much more restrictive kind of order and is still used much more restrictively and in a restrained manner than in India. In India, I think you have to take most amount of credit for the popularization of this order. So uh, do you uh, feel otherwise from Sir, Sir Hugh Laddie is one question. The second one is about uh, the Sony judgment. I actually didn't know about it till you just mentioned it. Uh, so I quickly looked it up. And from what I see, what was prevented was the usage of unauthorized games on Sony PS3 devices. So what the person basically did was allow this device which he or she had bought and allow it to play games which Sony does not want to play on that console. So what I'd like to know is, since unlike DMCA, since quite unlike DMCA 1201, in India 65A is linked 
2.14, uh, and the first part of it says that uh, effective technological measure applied for the purpose of protecting any of the rights conferred by this act. So I'd like to know what of the section 14 rights were violated through this process of jailbreaking. Because I gave a lecture in a different university uh, a couple of weeks ago and was asked specifically by a student about jailbreaking and I very confidently said jailbreaking is perfectly legal in India. So, uh, and, and I've been proven wrong by, by the Delhi High Court, so I'd like to know why I was wrong uh, on, on a reading of the law. Not on, on you know, uh, these ideas of access, etc., but just on a purely legal reading of the law. Just remind me, I have, I suffer from short-term memory losses. Just remind me what your first question was. You, laddie. Just a catch word. You, laddie. You, Anton Pillar. Right. Okay. Hugh Laddie was a very dear friend of mine. At one of the parties, he told one of our judges, and we had been working very hard on building up this whole culture amongst judges of Anton Pillar and, and strong remedies and so on. And suddenly Hugh Laddie comes and says, Anton Pillar, gosh, we stopped granting them in England. And he just said that. And the judge looked at me and looked at the other judge and said, what? And the kind of flutter that kind of went across the room, I told you, Laddie, later, I said, what have you done? What has actually happened in England, what had ha happened by the time that you, Laddie, uh, mentioned the tightening up that was taking place, was misuse of the Anton Pillar. In one particular case, he described that they were there for 17 hours at the not allowing any lady to leave, not allowing people to leave their room, go to the loos, go and change, go do anything, attend to children. They didn't allow anybody to leave. And the judges got so angry with that way, the, with the way that Anton Pillar order had been carried out, that they said, rubbish, we've had enough. So they'd gone a full circle. Unfortunately, in this country, no. In this country, it's a porous country. And you want, we'll sit down. And I will give you 350 different ways in which information leaks out from the Delhi court. It is so unfortunate that you cannot keep the salary of your staff confidential in this country. So you can't give incentives. You have to have different rules. Why? Because everybody knows everything. And that's what happens when you want to raid somebody. It's a different country. Don't talk about comparing us to England, where there are certain cultures, where there are, certain, there, there, there are certain systems. We don't have those systems. We have different systems. That's as far as Anton Pillar order is concerned. The moment a judge sees a misuse in the Anton Pillar order, in Delhi to the judge or anywhere else in the country, our judges will go berserk. And there's always the possibility of building in safeguards. We've started building in safeguards in our orders, on our own, to make sure that it's a balanced order. And that's probably the only way you will be able to catch a pirate. And in the digital world, it's impossible, because it takes seconds for somebody to destroy the pirated software. There'll be no evidence. And people lie on affidavits in this country, dime a dozen every day. All right? That's as far as your first question is concerned. As far as the second question is concerned, which of the Section 14 rights is the one which is violated? Again, I'm not, at the present moment, I can't answer accurately. You've studied it recently. I've studied it at the time when I argued the matter. But as far as I recollect, it's the reproduction right. It enabled a reproduction. Now, I'm not saying with certainty at the moment, one requires a closer scrutiny, but obviously one of the Section 14 rights is alleged to have been violated. And the plaint is full of it. Perhaps if you've got the internet, you might also like to see the plaint, because the Delhi, on the Delhi High Court website, you can even see the plaint. So you might like to see what is the right which is alleged to have been violated. All right? Yeah. Any other question? 
Yes, one more question from uh, our friend. Yeah. Please keep it brief now, because uh, we have uh, Mr. Anand would. Uh, after the amendment in IT Act, uh, an intermediary is supposed to maintain uh, all their track records for 90 days. So, if we can uh, relate that particular, I mean, if we can tag that particular information to a particular user, will we be able to identify the uh, uploader and the downloader who is using this internet, internet as a conduit for piracy? Uh, can I do that under uh, any law or any technologically? Is it possible? I mean, will I be able to tag that particular person? Where did you get that 90 days? Is it in the uh, it's there in the IT Act, but I'm not sure about the provisions. Under the IT Act? IT Act. Uh, because... Not, not familiar. Uh, not familiar with that, I'll have to study. I can't answer. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's all right. You don't have to apologize for our ignorance on these issues. But let me say, ask a more, uh, a different question. Uh, is it really desirable? I mean, do, would you like this kind of prying into everything? Momentarily, you click on something and it goes to, I mean, my, all of us uh, adults here, it goes to the Playboy website and then somebody tracks it out and gives it to my wife and says, your, your husband has been going there. <laughs> I wonder why he mentioned that. Uh, These are the travails of being married, and I don't want to add the IT Act also to my travails. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I too agree with that, but still, if the US government has reported a 2 billion loss in their revenue in, from entertainment sector, <laughs> lies. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I, I, I would uh, entirely and more than entirely agree with Pranesh there. Don't go about these figures. These figures have so many lies, so many misrepresentations. Okay, just don't go by these figures unless they come from a government authenticated source which has been vouched for by somebody else also because there are government authenticated. I would refer you to the uh, April 2010 report of the Government Accountability Office of the United States to the US Congress. Just read it about the figures. Okay, and then you'll see how the government departments the Customs and Border Patrol and the FBI have been uh, rendering forged figures or figures that they have rendered over a period of many years and then they have washed their hands off that regarding the impact, economic impact of counterfeiting. So, uh, figures uh, would be, uh, there would definitely be some kind of an impact somewhere, but not these figures. Don't buy these figures just like that. Yeah. Yeah, so what we will do is uh, we'll now move on. But before that, since Mr. Anand has to go, he has a flight to catch. So may I request the organizers to... Uh yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Anand, and thank you for taking Shamnath sir's threat seriously and coming here today.